Hi, Gabriella, can you hear us? Everybody able to hear? Perfect, thank you. Is it Kiana? Spencer's good? Perfect, thank you. Great. We got a couple more minutes. Does anybody else have any questions before we get started about Zoom or anything else we've got going on? Not seeing anything. No, everybody's quiet today. I know most of you don't get talkative till about 6.30, so. Well, it looks like it's six o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Lacey Ballinger, and I am the Director of Collections here at the Tallahassee Museum. Actually, I'm the Director of Collections and Exhibits, but uh, thank you for joining us for the most recent installation of Museum Mixology. Each week, we offer this virtual lecture series on Thursdays at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, I know our lecturer this week is in uh, Central Standard Time, so she's a little bit earlier than we are. Um, but the purpose of this series is to provide a variety of unique educational experiences, including cocktails and crime, sipping with science, and a toast to history. And as you can see over my head, it's a toast to history this evening. And um, we'll be offering it again every week. I hope you've had a chance to stop by Madison Social this week and pick up a cocktail to go, um, hopefully related to shipwrecks or underwater archaeology. They try to theme it for us every week. Um, and a part of those proceeds do come back to the museum. And if you didn't, I've, I've put a link up to our virtual tip jar behind me as well. Uh, there we go, let me move out of the way. Um, so if you are enjoying this series, please take a chance to go to our virtual tip jar and donate. Um, we really appreciate it. It does help the museum continue programs like this. And because of you, we are able to advance the cultural and educational impact of the museum. So tonight we have Nicole Grennan with us who currently works with the Florida Public Archaeology Network. And she's gonna be talking about shipwrecks of Northwest Florida. Um, the Public, Florida Public Archaeology Network is a program of the University of West Florida, and as a research associate and public archaeologist of Florida's Northwest region, she graduated with a master's degree in historical archaeology from the University of West Florida in 2014 and received a bachelor degree in anthropology and history from the University of Central Florida in 2010. Nicole is currently working on a doctoral degree in cultural heritage with the Iron Bridge International Institute for Cultural Heritage at the University of Birmingham, which of course is in the UK. Uh, before joining FPAN as a public archaeologist in 2012, she worked as an outreach assistant with FPAN, an intern with Biscayne National Park, and as an assistant with the NASA History Division. 
Nicole is also registered as a professional or uh, a registered a professional archaeologist RPA, a certified interpretive guide through National Association for Interpretation, the NAI, and a scuba instructor. She currently serves on the board of directors for the Society for Historical Archaeology and for the American Academy of Underwater Scientists. Nicole's research interests include maritime archaeology and history, public interpretation of maritime maritime cultural resources and social history. So I wanna thank you for your continued support and please welcome Nicole as she gets started. Thank you, Lacey, for the lovely introduction. Absolutely. And I'm thank you for having here. me tonight. <laughs> yes, so am I. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so just, to, just like Lacey said, my name is Nicole Grenan. I work for the Florida Public Archaeology Network uh, which is a program of the University of West Florida. Um, and although I'm based here in Pensacola in our coordinating center, we actually do have offices all around the state, including one in Tallahassee. So I have two wonderful colleagues, uh, Barbara and Tristan, who work in our North Central Regional Office in Tallahassee. So I am going to probably just go ahead and jump right into it. I'm gonna share my screen, and I'll probably ask for confirmation from from you all that you can see it. All right, can, yes. let me, you can see it, okay. Yes. Let's see, and I'm gonna pull up, let's see, we have a chat function. I'm gonna go ahead and pull that up so I can just see if anyone has any questions during the talk. And of course, if you do have any questions, um, probably maybe it would work best if we save them for the end, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have related to underwater archaeology or anything in the presentation today. So let me organize my screens here. Um, Lacey asked me to come and talk about shipwrecks of Northwest Florida, and this is one of my favorite presentations to give. The title is a little bit misleading. Uh, there are hundreds of shipwrecks in Northwest Florida, and I could spend all night uh, talking your ear off about the shipwreck resources that we have in our area. Um, to kind of whittle that down to save you all a lot of time, um, I've kind of broken down the presentation into two parts. Uh, the first part is talking a little bit more about what shipwrecks are and what they mean to archaeologists. I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there about uh, underwater archaeology and shipwrecks. So it's always good to kind of rehash those things. Um, and then the second part of the presentation is about three shipwrecks in Northwest Florida. So three kind of outstanding examples of shipwrecks in the Florida Panhandle um, that are all divable for recreational scuba divers, if you're a scuba diver. And they're all part of the state's underwater archeological preserves program, which I'll talk more about here in a second. So again, let's, let's delve right into it. I'm gonna start with what shipwrecks are. Let's see, organizing screens again here. All right. So like I said, there are a lot of misconceptions about underwater and underwater archaeology and shipwrecks. And as someone who does public archaeology or uh, is a public educator on a daily basis, uh, this is one of the biggest hurdles in my job, specifically as it relates to underwater resources. When people think about shipwrecks and archaeology, uh, they think about pirate treasure. They think about Spanish gold, particularly here in Florida. And while there are certainly pirate shipwrecks, there are two or three identified pirate shipwrecks um, that have had archaeology done on them. And while there are certainly instances of ships that have, Spanish ships that have wrecked um, with treasure or gold on them, there's those kinds of shipwrecks are certainly in the minority here in Florida. And you know, the, the diversity of shipwrecks over really thousands of years, if we include prehistoric or pre-contact Native American uh, dugout canoes, um, it's a lot more rich than just those pirate ships and the Spanish uh, treasure ships. Those things are very interesting in their own right, uh, but there's a lot more going on with people in our state and in our country and in the entire Atlantic world during the last thousand years. And sh regarding shipwrecks themselves, a lot of people think about shipwrecks as um, kind of these, these vessels that have sunk in the sea and they're just kind of sitting there like the day that they sank. 
And in Florida, that's certainly not the case. Uh, in the Great Lakes in the United States, we do see some really well-preserved shipwrecks. And that's because the water is so very cold and there's not a lot of life living in those places. Florida waters are completely different. Um, we have warm, um, organically rich waters here in Florida and shipwrecks tend not to last very long. Um, wood eating organisms get at them, fish inhabit them, um, oyster beds inhabit them. And then of course you can't forget how dynamic our coastlines are. Storms and hurricanes move through almost constantly and that changes the way these shipwrecks look over time. And so, you know, our shipwrecks here in Florida don't look like the ones in the Great Lakes, and they certainly don't look like the ones in this image, um, you know, with skeletons lashed to the wheel and the sails still billowing. Um, it's actually, I think, a lot more interesting than that. Every shipwreck is a little bit different. Um, and these next few images are just some examples of what shipwrecks do look like. And so this first one is a uh, steamship that sunk in the Seminole River. So um, full disclosure, this is not actually in Florida. This is just across the border in Alabama in the Seminole River. Um, but this is what a shipwreck actually looks like, right? Oh, let me zoom in here. Another shipwreck. This is in the Florida Keys, if you couldn't tell by, by how beautiful the water is. Um, this is a ship called the Mystery Wreck. This was a ship that sank. Um, we don't completely know when, hence the name Mystery Wreck. It was a wooden vessel. We do know that because there's none of the actual structure of the shipwreck left. Um, it was eaten away and kind of torn apart over time by storms. But what we do have left is this amazing uh, ballast pile, right? So this is what a shipwreck looks like here in Florida. Here's another shipwreck. This is one, um, not too far from where I am here in Pensacola along the coastline and this is what you're seeing is essentially the very bottom of that shipwreck structure right so you're seeing the long line moving away from the screen or toward the screen is the keelson of the shipwreck um, and kind of the the timbers coming out to the side the ribs of the ship those are its frames and so you're just seeing the very bottom this was a ship we believe was, of course, tossed onto the beach during a storm and kind of left to just rot over time and has been covered and uncovered uh, by sand as storms move in and out. As archeologists, we get calls a lot that people have discovered a shipwreck on the beach. And I always feel bad about telling them that, no, indeed, this has just been there for a very long time. We've documented it, um, but it just comes and goes over time. Here are a couple shipwrecks here in Pensacola, Florida, uh, where I am. This is in a place called Shields Cove. And this is, um, if you're familiar with Pensacola area, this is in one of our local rivers leading up to the northern part of the state, the Blackwater River. And Shields Cove was a part of the river where um, there's no real traffic. The main channel is, is some distance away. And so around 1900, um, this became a ship's graveyard. So there are about 15 documented vessels in this Shields Cove area. It actually makes a fantastic snorkel um, for people and for kids. And at low tide, as you can see, the shipwreck timbers are actually visible above the water level. Um, and what you're seeing here are actually two shipwrecks and they're kind of, I like to use these as examples of how ship technology um, is different based on purpose. Right on the right side of the screen, you see kind of a big triangular wooden mass. Um, that was a, a cargo um, barge, right? So this would have carried either timber or bricks from the northern part of our area down to the port of Pensacola. Uh, the shipwreck you see on the left was a lumber schooner, a very large schooner that would have unloaded lumber and then traveled uh, in the offshore waters in the Gulf of Mexico in the Atlantic to transport lumber. Um, so some very good examples of ship technology. And again, these are what shipwrecks actually look like. So if you, you'll pardon me, I know I, I talked earlier, I kind of um, ragged on pirates a little bit, but one of my favorite quotes about underwater archeology span or loosely related to underwater archeology span actually does come from Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, it's a quote from Captain Jack Sparrow. Um, and what he says is that's what a ship is. It's not just a keel and a hull and a deck and sails. That's what a ship needs. But what a ship is, and in this case, he's talking about his ship, the Black Pearl. Uh, but what a ship is, is freedom. And so I like this quote because it encapsulates how archaeologists approach underwater archaeology and underwater archaeology of shipwreck sites, right? 
for us, it's not about the stuff. The stuff is cool and the shipwrecks themselves are very cool, but what we're trying to get at is the story behind that stuff, the history. We're trying to learn about the human past, right? And we can learn so much from shipwrecks. We can learn about people's life ways, right? We can learn about um, social hierarchies just based on the way ships are constructed. We can learn about trade and commerce. What were people trading from one place to another around the world? Um, we can learn about navigation. You know, before there was GPS, before there were satellites, how did people get ships from one place to another? Um, and some of those methods are really inventive. Shipwrecks can tell us about colonization and movement, how people ended up where they are. Shipwrecks can tell us about the development of warfare over time, how those technologies have changed, right? How people, unfortunately, have developed ways uh, to kill each other. Um, those things are all visible on shipwrecks. Shipwrecks can also tell us about disease, and this is, of course, a little timely, but we actually see um, rat bones on ships in Europe dating to the Middle Ages from when the plague was a very big problem. And as many of us have learned in, in history class, uh, the plague was carried often on rats. And those rats went, on, rats went on to ships, and those ships traveled from port to port. So we can actually kind of track the spread of these, these plagues in Europe based on rat bones that display you know, the symptoms of that disease. So very interesting thing there. Um, and shipwrecks tell us about language and culture. Why here in the United States we speak languages, predominantly languages like English and Spanish and French and Portuguese. Um, those languages weren't in North America, Central America, South America 2000 years ago. Those languages came on ships. Um, so really all of this is just again to say that shipwrecks are telling us about people. We're trying to get at the story of the past by studying these physical remains. Now, why are shipwrecks important archaeologically? Um, shipwrecks are kind of an interesting case study, and it's one of the things that drew me to underwater archaeology in the first place, is that uh, people on land tend to live in the same places over time, right? We like high ground, of course. We also have to have a source of food and a source of fresh water, right? We need kind of a, our little safety net to survive. And for that reason, people tend to have lived in the same places over time. It's only relatively recently that uh, advances in technology and construction techniques have allowed us to kind of move into places where people don't normally live. But in busy cities like Tallahassee, Pensacola, um, people have been living in the same spot for hundreds or even thousands of years. And that record gets really mixed up in terrestrial sites. So for archaeologists, it can be difficult, difficult to tease out what comes from where and what time. Underwater, the case is totally different. Uh, people don't live underwater. And generally, when a ship wrecks, another ship is not going to wreck on top of it. And so for that reason, we call shipwrecks closed context, right? Everything that went down on the ship is what's there on that ship. Now, of course, there is marine debris. Um, we find beer cans and we find Gatorade bottles on shipwreck sites all the time, but we can tease those things out as archaeologists. And actually, the image you're seeing here, just real quick, is a collection of artifacts from a shipwreck here in Pensacola from 1559. Um, so actually, the earliest uh, shipwreck here in the state of Florida is right here in Pensacola Bay. Uh, it's the second oldest shipwreck in the United States. Uh, Texas has this beat by a couple of years, unfortunately. Um, Along with calling shipwrecks closed context, uh, we could also essentially call them time capsules, right? Like I said, everything that went down with that shipwreck is still on it when it goes down, unless this ship was salvaged later. And so, you know, it's essentially a snapshot in time when you look at artifact collections from these archeological sites. And so again, here's just an image of a collection of artifacts from that 1559 shipwreck here in Pensacola. And you see all different um, kind of aspects of life on board a ship and for starting a new colony, which is what those people were here to do in 1559. Um, and we see, it's a little difficult to see, but we see rat bones there, a stone cannon shot, olive jars for transporting olive oil and other food types, uh, serving ware, animal bones, all kinds of things. Um, so a time capsule. And here's a close-up shot of those rat bones from that 1559 shipwreck here in Pensacola. Shipwreck sites have excellent preservation. 
a much better preservation than terrestrial archaeological sites here in the United States, generally. Um, if a shipwreck site is covered up relatively quickly after its sinking episode, um, then the sediment or sand or whatever has covered it up creates an anaerobic environment. Um, and by anaerobic, I mean non-oxygenated, right? Life can't live in those sediments. And so everything survives in that anaerobic environment to some degree. And so even these teeny tiny rat bones survived almost 450 years here in Pensacola Bay. And it wasn't until archaeologists were started excavating um, that, you know, they were found again. So really significant um, for archaeologists, the preservation on shipwreck sites. So kind of the big picture about underwater archaeology is we've talked about shipwrecks give us information about the human past, right? The stuff is cool, the shipwrecks are cool, um, but we're trying to get at that story of the past so that we can then share it with everyone else. I always try to emphasize that archaeology and history don't belong to archaeologists and historians, right? They belong to everybody. Everybody has a stake in these histories and people all over the world are in connect interconnected. So whether you're a resident of Florida or not, Sometimes these things have meaning. Um, another important thing to remember too is that shipwrecks are non-renewable resources. Um, you know, we're not growing any new uh, Spanish galleons here in Florida. These things aren't going to come back. So if we don't work to preserve them, record the information we can get from them, um, they, any future potential impacts, no matter what they are, um, could result in a significant loss of information for us. And another really important point too is that yes, the history and the archaeology is cool, but these shipwrecks have important meanings to our local communities, especially our coastal communities here in Florida. Um, recreational activities like fishing and scuba diving are incredibly important for our economy. And shipwrecks provide opportunities for the enhancement of that industry, right? So heritage tourism on shipwreck sites is absolutely huge and something we want to continue to promote. So shipwrecks are of course important for archeologists, but it's important to remember that they are significant biologically as well. Anything here in the state of Florida that goes in the water, right, becomes a home to something else very quickly. Florida has a lot of sandy bottom, particularly here in the Panhandle. We do have some karst or limestone outcroppings and some natural bottom, um, but there's a lot of sand out there. And so when something lands on the ground, whether it's a, an artificial reef that we plant today for attracting fish or a shipwreck from 200 years ago, um, these things are going to become homes, hands down. And so that's another reason why it's important to preserve these sites. Um, as artificial reefs, they're shelter for juvenile fish, which can enhance biological populations. They're also a substrate for invertebrates. And so here I'm mostly talking about corals. And in our area, not so much hard corals, but soft corals. We do have soft corals here in the Panhandle. Um, but of course, like everything, there are problems affecting shipwrecks. And some of them are human impacts. Some of them are environmental impacts. Um, oop, let me go back here, sorry. Um, and some of the human impacts I think are pretty obvious. Um, a lot of times when people scuba dive on these sites, they like to collect something to remind them of their adventure. And unfortunately, the idea is that, you know, if everybody goes underwater and visits the site and collects something, uh, then that ship eventually won't be there anymore. So souvenir collecting is, is a harmless activity. I think it's just a result of um, not thinking about preservation as we visit these sites. Um, it would be like taking something from a state or a national park which in many cases are what these shipwrecks are. Um, looting is a little more nefarious, of course. This is the intentional removal of material from shipwreck sites for, for profit. Um, and that, of course, is a big problem here in Florida. Um, a lot of the laws that we have in place today only came into play starting around um, the early 90s um, and maybe a little bit before that. But, but yes, it still happens, of course. Um, and then, of course, inadvertent human impacts people going up to a shipwreck site, they drop their anchor because they're going to go fishing and that anchor drops right through the deck of that shipwreck, right? That would be a bad inadvertent human impact. Erosion is a natural process, but often a result of human activities like development or dredging. 
Um, climate change impacts are huge for underwater sites in many, many ways. Um, so yes, there are of course many problems affecting shipwreck sites. And that's one of the reasons that I like to do this presentation is just to kind of make people aware that, that these things kind of happen. And it's a lot to say that these things are impacted, but kind of showing you what happens it says more, I think a picture's worth a thousand words. Um, so here is a site called the San Pedro. And this was, this was a Spanish uh, treasure ship that's now become um, an underwater park. Um, the site was very beautiful when it was first discovered, but of course it was torn to pieces um, by folks who were trying to find treasure on that ship. And this is what the site looks like today. Now, if I'm a scuba operator operating out of South Florida, I'm probably not going to be bringing divers out to this site. There's not a whole lot to see there anymore. Some scattering of broken timbers mostly is what you're seeing. So again, heritage tourism completely diminished in this case. Here uh, is broken coral on a shipwreck. And I'm sorry that this image comes up a little grainy. These are broken pieces of coral that were actually removed from a shipwreck in the Florida Keys. Um, to get at the timbers of the shipwreck so that um, I presumably a person could find an artifact of value. Um, this particular shipwreck was a cargo vessel um, hauling uh, coal, I believe, so nothing of value was there anyways. And just another quick example, this is a, another ballast pile from a shipwreck and this too is in the Florida Keys. Um, that's kind of where our Florida's history of treasure hunting and salvage exists is in the Florida Keys. Um, but this was a ballast pile moved around so that someone could create a lobster casitas or houses so that they could then go and collect their lobster later. Um, so again, lots of impacts. Not only do they affect the archaeology and the history, but they do affect marine life, biological diversity, and uh, heritage tourism opportunities for our local communities. So kind of getting into our shipwrecks here. Um, the shipwrecks that I chose to talk about in this presentation are all part of the state of Florida's underwater archaeological preserves. They're all shipwrecks that are in state waters, um, and they're part of a program called Museums in the Sea. And this program was developed in the late 80s and the early 90s to protect and preserve these resources, but more importantly, to educate the public about the importance of shipwrecks and to provide an easy way for people to go visit these sites um, in an educational way, to learn something along the way. Um, and that, of course, promotes heritage tourism in our area. Um, so Florida's shipwreck preserves, as we call them, um, are 12 shipwrecks around the state of Florida. We have three of them in Florida's Panhandle and a fourth one in the Big Bend area, called, but that one is in the rivers, the Suwannee. Um, but we have shipwrecks all over the state of Florida and 12 total. Um, this is a poster for Florida Shipwreck Preserves, um, which I do here, do have here in Pensacola. Uh, if there's anyone interested in getting one of these posters, certainly just let me know. I'll throw up my email at the end of the presentation, and um, I can have my staff in that area um, get you a poster. So, yes, here's our poster. We're going to be talking about the three shipwrecks in the Panhandle, of course, USS Massachusetts, the SS Tarpon, and Weimar. Um, for the underwater preserve sites in the state of Florida, this is a, a, a program that was really a grassroots program. All of these shipwrecks were nominated by local communities to be a part of the underwater preserves. Um, and at each of the sites, uh, a cement and brass plaque was installed so that individuals visiting the sites would learn a little bit about them while they were out there if they didn't know they were on a preserve site anyway. Um, over time, these things, and especially after hurricanes, these things get moved around. Um, but we rely on the local communities to tell us uh, when these things go missing or they, or uh, or damaged, so that we can replace them. And there is a companion website, um, and unfortunately, it is in desperate need of uh, updating. Um, but Florida's museumsinthesea.com. Um, is a great website and can tell you more information about all of the shipwrecks on the trail, not just the three that we're going to talk about, as well as some photos and information on how to dive the sites as well if you are a scuba diver. Interestingly, uh, uh, all of the shipwreck preserve sites in the state of Florida that we have um, are on the National Register of Historic Places. So they have been deemed to be significant enough to um, local, state, and national history to be put on the National Register, um, which is kind of interesting. 
Um, and if we do have any scuba divers, just to kind of reemphasize the point I already made. One of the, the kind of taglines we like to put out there when diving these shipwreck sites and underwater preserves in particular um, is that we want to treat them like we treat parks. And they are parks, um, but people often, um, there's a disconnect between land and sea for some reason with people. Um, so our kind of slogan is to take only photos and leave only bubbles when we dive these sites. So. Let's jump right into the USS Massachusetts. Um, oh, let me go back. This is a painting done of USS Massachusetts for the Underwater Preserves Program. And when we talk about USS Massachusetts here, we're actually talking about BB2, so the very first Massachusetts. Um, and USS Massachusetts is an Indiana class of vessel, which was launched in 1893 as part of the New Steel Navy. Um, after the American Civil War and, um, you know, the Spanish-American War period, there was a realization that the American Navy was in desperate need of updating, especially in comparison to some of our European counterparts. And so the New Steel Navy was an initiative to update our Navy, and Massachusetts is a result of that. Um, she is 350 feet long. She has a 69 foot beam, um, beam meaning width, for those of you who aren't ship nerds, um, and a 24 foot draft. Um, the USS Massachusetts did see action in the Spanish-American War. Um, she sailed to Cuba to blockade the ports of Cienfuegos and Santiago. Um, and this period that she was in action there was roughly uh, in 1898 from April to August. She unfortunately, whoop, missed some of the, the major action because she was um, refueling for coal. Um, she saw action in the Spanish-American War. Um, goodness, why is it doing that? Um, at the onset of World War I, um, there was another realization that even though these, this new steel navy had been launched as a way to adapt to modern warfare, warfare technology was changing once again. And so by the time World War I rolled around, USS Massachusetts and her sister ships were completely out of date technology. Um, and so during World War I, um, she was kind of refitted and used as a gunnery practice ship. And I think, let's see, what's my next image here. So this was her during her sinking outside of Pensacola. But when she was used as a gunnery practice ship, they also did some refitting of her. And I don't know if you can see my mouse, um, but you can see this kind of aft mast here. It's, it's a caged mast, and that is actually for a telegraph system that was used. So it was a practice ship in several ways. And what's kind of neat is that this telegraph was actually installed by Marconi himself, that famous Italian um, inventor. Um, so that telegraph main mast is a dead giveaway for USS Massachusetts. Um, the technology had changed really quickly. So she had spent some time as a gunnery practice ship for midshipmen during World War I, but then she was again decommissioned in 1919 and really kind of saw the end of her useful life, unfortunately. She was towed to Pensacola in 1921 uh, to be used as an experimental uh, artillery target. Um, and what the Navy was developing at this point was a, a system of uh, guns that could travel along railroad tracks anywhere in the United States. So kind of the threat of World War I had woken us up to the fact that um, uh, attacks could come from anywhere. And of course, you know, World War II followed not long after. And so the idea was to be able to protect the American coast from anywhere at a moment's notice. And so the Navy developed this system of traveling guns on railroad tracks. And Pensacola has railroad tracks running right along the coastline. And so USS Massachusetts was towed to Pensacola, um, kind of left outside of Pensacola Pass on the east side and used for target practice. There are some excellent uh, newspaper articles of, uh, um, and kind of commentary from local citizens about uh, these large guns and their shot flying over downtown Pensacola and busting out the windows of local banks, right? Um, <laughs> this was a major disturbance to life in Pensacola, but at this point, people were very used to naval presence in this area, so nothing new um, in the way of, uh, of action. So what you see here, so 
USS Massachusetts was sunk on the east side of Pensacola Pass, and in typical fashion, military fashion, they decided that was not where they wanted it, so they floated it again and brought it over to the west side of Pensacola Pass, where it is today. And this is what you're seeing in this image here. So you can see her kind of starting to sink into the sand a little bit after being used for target practice. And here is another great image. Um, one of my favorite images, actually, this is, again, Massachusetts. While being used for target practice, you can see a lot of the upper works at this point had um, kind of already been destroyed and taken apart. Um, and this is a photo from a fishing schooner, a, a sailing boat um, operating in Pensacola around this time, around the, um, 1921. And uh, it always seemed to me like that fishing schooner was getting just a little bit too close uh, to Massachusetts as she was being shot at. Um, but a great photo nevertheless. So Massachusetts for many years afterward was kind of an icon outside of Pensacola. Um, the, the ship itself um, isn't a part right outside Pensacola Pass, so right out of the main channel into Pensacola Bay, and it's only in about maybe 25 to 30 feet of water. So it's, it's not very deep at all. And of course, we saw that the ship itself was much taller than 25 feet. Um, so a significant portion of it stuck out of the water for quite a while. Let me go back here. Um, where's my photo? There we go. Um, here's a relatively recent photo of Massachusetts. So after some time, a lot of the, the big upper works um, from Massachusetts were um, salvaged. Um, especially during World War II, because any source of metal was a good source of metal and needed for the war effort. So a lot of that upper work was taken off um, during World War II. Um, but USS Massachusetts is still technically visible above the water at low tide. And what you're seeing here in this image are Massachusetts's uh, two gun turrets, her two large gun turrets sticking out of the water. Um, and unfortunately for, for boaters, it is marked as a, a hazard to navigation, um, but if, if folks are out on the water having a good time, they've had a couple of Coronas, boats do tend to still run into Massachusetts uh, gun turrets, especially if they're just below the waterline. And, uh, you know, might have a scrape or two on those gun turrets, but they, Massachusetts certainly does a lot more damage to, uh, to folks' boats than they do to it. Um, but interestingly, um, the U.S. military actually awarded title of USS Massachusetts to the state of Florida in 1956. And that's kind of a rare thing for the U.S. military to do, particularly the Navy. They tend to retain ownership of even their ship, uh, wrecked ships over time. But this, uh, this wreck, USS Massachusetts, was awarded uh, to the state of Florida, um, which is why it was able to become one of Florida's fourth underwater archaeological preserves in 1993. So here's another image. Again, you can kind of see those turrets just sticking out above the water ever so slightly. Um, and USS Massachusetts has, again, like I said, been a local icon. It's been a great fishing spot. It's a very popular scuba diving spot. Um, and it's something that most Pensacola natives are, are familiar with. Um, here are the drawings of USS Massachusetts. The, the top drawing or plan of Massachusetts. Uh, this is before she wrecked. Um, and so one interesting thing to note, um, on the front of the vessel, kind of here, these are about 18 inch thick protective plates on the outside of the hull, which are very interesting. And you'll actually see those in one of the upcoming photos. The bottom plan or map is USS Massachusetts as she exists as a shipwreck. And this is a little bit out of date. This was produced um, for her release as a preserve in 1993, uh, but it looks a lot like this today. Massachusetts is very, very big, very heavy ship, um, and so it doesn't change too terribly much when those major storms roll through. Although I have heard um, that a lot of the kind of the deck plating is starting to fall and collapse. Um, so here is a photo, Massachusetts, you can have very good visibility when you're diving USS Massachusetts, um, but sometimes the visibility is not so great. Images tend to come out really um, granular. If you're a diver in the Florida Panhandle, then you know visibility can be amazing or it can be very terrible. Usually it's terrible, um, but 
shipwreck diving is enjoyable nonetheless. And what you're seeing here is the outer hull of USS Massachusetts. And on the very outside, away from that scuba diver, is that 18 inch thick metal planing. Um, this would have protected the ship from ammunition fire. Just some more photos of Massachusetts. Some various uh, parts show some machinery here. Um, this is a diver kind of popping out of the deck, which I don't recommend doing a penetration dive on USS Massachusetts if you're a scuba diver. Um, it is falling apart, so don't want to endanger anybody. Um, one very interesting fact about um, USS Massachusetts process to becoming an underwater archaeological preserve is that in 1992, right when the Florida Bureau of Archaeological Research was doing work to make Massachusetts a preserve, they actually identified um, a lone surviving crew member, um, which is pretty, pretty amazing. Um, he would have been trained on the ship when it was refitted for um, uh, gunnery practice. Um, and unfortunately, um, he did pass away before uh, Massachusetts was released as an underwater archaeological preserve, but he was uh, an invaluable source of photos and information for the archaeological team working on this project. And very quickly, one of the most interesting features about USS Massachusetts is this winged victory sculpture. Um, and this was actually presented to the ship by the state of Massachusetts. And there were uh, drives among school children and local communities to collect pennies and money to, to uh, uh, provide this sculpture to, to the ship um, when she was launched. And this is kind of before the, the American tradition of states presenting their namesake ships with uh, things like uh, silver or um, a platter or plates for uh, officers. Um, so this is kind of an early iteration of that. The Wing Victory sculpture was actually removed from the ship um, before she sank. So you can't see it on the shipwreck if you dive it today. It's actually located in the US Naval Academy, um, which is really interesting in Annapolis. Um, and then here's a plaque over here um, on the right, just kind of honoring um, USS Massachusetts, and then a, a replica of the Winged Victory sculpture at the top. And this is at, um, in Florida at the Department of State. So that's USS Massachusetts and its amazing history. Um, we're going to move kind of east, so we're going to continue a trend east through this presentation, um, to the steamship Tarpon. And the steamship Tarpon has another amazing history albeit a little bit different than Massachusetts. So the Tarpon, as we know it today, was actually built in Delaware in 1887 and was named uh, Naugatuck. It's an iron hulled vessel uh, that measures approximately 130 feet in length. It has a 26 foot beam or width and has an eight foot draft or depth of hold. She is powered by twin compound four and aft steam engines uh, with twin iron propellers. Um, so really a kind of marvel of late 19th century shipping technology. Um, and you can see uh, the images here are when she was named Tarpon was a little bit later. She was eventually bought and renamed Tarpon in 1891. She was actually lengthened uh, by 30 feet. Um, and she was used to transport troops and supplies to and from Cuba during the Spanish-American War. So same kind of period as USS Massachusetts. Uh, but after the war, she was sold. So in 1902, she was sold to the Pensacola, St. Andrews, and Gulf Steamship Company. Um, and she was used primarily as a um, passenger and cargo ship traveling along the Florida Panhandle. And those are kind of the images that you see there. These are from that era of her life. And so Tarpon and her captain, who was named Willis G. Barrow, became famous in the Florida Panhandle during this time period. This is the period before we had reliable passenger transport on railroad, before we had major highways and roads connecting cities along the Florida Panhandle. Um, these ships were the way you got around. And so Tarpon had a route that was very well known amongst everybody in the Panhandle, uh, from Mobile to Pensacola, to St. Andrews Bay, to Apalachicola, and to Carabelle, Florida. 
And so she would travel back and forth on this route, carrying cargo, carrying passengers. Um, and actually, she did this so much between, and you, as you can see, 1903 to 1937, um, that she traveled what we've estimated to be about 700,000 miles. And if that seems kind of abstract, it's equal to about 28 times around the earth is what she traveled um, just doing this route. And her captain, Willis uh, Barrow, was with her for the entirety of that time. And they completed total, before she wrecked, about 1,500 voyages um, just doing this, which is really impressive. And the captain had a famous quote uh, that I think a lot of people in this area knew at the time, um, that God makes the weather and I make the trip. Right? That's how reliable this route of the tarpon was. She was a main thoroughfare for people moving in and around the Florida Panhandle. Um, so in 1933, um, yep, Captain Barrow had ran tarpon for about 30 years. Um, in 1937 is when she sank in a storm on September 1st. Um, the weather had been predicted to be to be nice and rather calm. Unfortunately, um, the wind freshened as it does here in Florida and especially in the northern Gulf uh, rather quickly. And early in the morning, right around 2 a.m., uh, the captain and the crew realized that there was a major problem with tarpon. And she was pretty old at this point. Um, the crew jettisoned a lot of the cargo that they had on board, which was um, you know, flour, cotton, all kinds of things. They threw it over to try and lighten the vessel to bring her up, but unfortunately it had been too late and water start coming, started coming over the sides of the ship. Um, there were lifeboats launched. Um, they were about 10 miles from the shore, I should add. Um, so not really within sight of, of land. And again, this was relatively late at night. Um, the crew and most of the passengers abandoned ship uh, there were a total of 31 people aboard. Unfortunately, there was a loss of life, a relatively significant loss of life. About 18 people died during the wrecking event, including Captain Barrow, um, which is just kind of a sad touch to this story. Um, of course, they had life jackets, and for many of those who survived, they were floating in the water for almost 30 hours. It wasn't until one of the crew members actually made swam from the wrecking location to St. Andrews Bay and flagged someone down in a car on the road uh, that they finally had uh, a rescue party sent out to the shipwreck. Um, so it happened relatively quickly and at night, which of course is never very good for, uh, for, for saving of life. Um, but, Today, tarpon is in uh, relatively deep water. So again, 10 miles off the coast of St. Andrew or Panama City area today. Um, so relatively deep, and this would be considered an advanced dive if you're a scuba diver. It's in about 90 to 95 feet of water um, in an area that's not uh, the greatest for visibility. But again, there are some very good days out there. And this is a, a map or a plan of that shipwreck that was produced by the Florida Bureau of Archaeological Research. Um, with some kind of information highlights, this is for divers, um, as they visit the site. So you can see things on the shipwreck, um, like the main boilers, you can see the propeller drive shafts, you can see some of the wooden decking that would have been on the ship. It was iron hulled, but it had a wooden deck. Um, anchor chain, the windlass for bringing up the anchor. Uh, so lots of really interesting features on this shipwreck. And so these are just a couple of photos from a good day out there. So you can see some of that outer hull plating from the shipwreck. Um, the tarpon became Florida's sixth underwater archeological preserve in 1997, again, after being nominated by the local community. Um, so another kind of fuzzy image, 95 feet deep and kind of poor visibility water. It's very difficult to capture images in those kinds of conditions. Um, so that is the story of tarpon. Um, so moving east yet again, we're going to visit uh, Weimar, which has one of uh, probably the most interesting stories uh, of any of the underwater archeological preserves. So it's one of my favorite to talk about. Um, and so Weimar, She was built in 1919 in England 
as a British gunboat. Um, so this would have been uh, World War I era, or just after World War I era when she was serving, but as a, as a, a patrol boat, essentially. Um, she was built at 170 feet long, uh, 30 foot beam or width, um, and she had a depth of hold at 16 feet or a draft of 16 feet. Um, her hull was a steel constructed hull, so a metal hull, and she had triple expansion steam engines uh, for propulsion. In the 1920s, so kind of after the threat of World War I was over, um, she was sold to a private company and renamed Chelsea. Um, shortly after that, she was confiscated by the United States government uh, for smuggling liquor during the Prohibition era. Um, so she ended up in the custody of the United States government, which is where she was found by Admiral Richard Byrd um, in 1928. So if, you, you, if you're interested in history and, and um, the history of uh, exploration or maritime history in general, then you're probably familiar with Admiral Byrd. Um, in 1928, he bought Chelsea from the American government uh, because not only was she cheap, but she was hopefully going to be able to help him fulfill his mission of flying over the South Pole. So this was his first expedition to the Antarctic. And what Admiral Byrd wanted to do was deconstruct a plane um, put it in the hold of a ship, um, bring that ship to Antarctica, reassemble the plane, and then fly over the South Pole. Unfortunately, the ships that he had already had uh, couldn't fulfill that, um, but he found Chelsea, um, what we now know as Weimar, um, and she had a large enough hold that he could fit that plane. Um, so he bought her from the, from the government for about $34,000 and refitted her. Um, and so what he did to kind of prepare uh, Weimar or Chelsea for this Antarctic expedition was to do a lot of reinforcement, right? Traveling to the Antarctic, cutting through ice is a whole different game for ships. Um, and so what he did was um, he kind of doubled up on that outer hull planking or outer hull plating a little bit to help preserve or to help, uh, to help cut through that ice. Um, so Another interesting kind of fact was that this ship was the first metal hulled vessel to actually travel to the Antarctic. Um, and Admiral Byrd renamed Chelsea. He renamed her Eleanor Bowling in honor of his mother. Um, but among the crew who traveled on her to the Antarctic, um, there was a joke and they renamed her Evermore Rolling because she couldn't really, uh, couldn't really cut it in those rough waters heading toward the Antarctic. Um, so let's see, I've got, I think, a photo. So here we go. Um, she was named the Evermore Rolling. So for her kind of ungraceful way of, of sailing or steaming along to uh, the Antarctic. Um, Admiral Byrd put in about $76,000 in repairs to the ship, um, which was about double what he bought her for. Um, and although she wasn't a very pleasant ride to the Antarctic, she did complete her mission in transporting that plane and Admiral Byrd did indeed uh, sail his plane, or uh, not sail, but fly his plane over the South Pole. Um, Admiral Byrd ended up selling um, Eleanor Bowling at this point after his expedition. He was planning additional expeditions, but uh, considered her uh, unseaworthy at this point and sold her uh, for about $15,000. So after all that, she was purchased, and this was the state of her after uh, Admiral Byrd's expedition, so not great looking, um, but she was purchased in 1933 by the Weimar Shipping Company, um, and she was renamed, of course, Weimar. She was re-outfitted yet again to serve uh, duty as a tramp steamer. So they basically slapped some new plating on and gave her a good paint job, so she looked like the image on the left. Um, and in doing so, they were able to extend her life for a period of time. And tramp steamers, essentially what they would do is they would sail all around looking for cargoes to take on and then sailing to wherever they thought they could get the highest price for that cargo. So cargoes like rice, uh, bat guano, coal, lumber, um, fruit in some cases, all kinds of cargoes. There wasn't one specific thing. Any kind of bulk cargo was the target for these ships. Um, and that was how Weimar eventually ended up in Port St. Joe, Florida. 
Um, she was coming to Port St. Joe to, to, um, to collect a load of lumber. Uh, Northwest Florida is very famous for it, its lumber stores over the years. And in 1942, she was coming into Port St. Joe to collect a load of lumber. Um, she loaded that lumber and then headed out, right? She was going off to sell it. Um, oh, let's see what images I've got here. Okay. So she was loading that lumber. She was on her way out. Um, she was guided out of the channel from Port St. Joe by the local pilot. Um, his name was Melvin Beck, um, and he was aboard the ship. Um, at this point, no one really quite knows what happens. Of course, we have the story from the crew and then the pilot, but there was a lot of speculation in Port St. Joe um, that there were nefarious, again, nefarious activities going on um, with Weimar when she sank. And we think that there were a couple reasons why the townspeople were so suspicious. Uh, a, it was 1942. We're at the height of World War II. There's a lot of concern about German U-boats and German sabotage in the Gulf of Mexico and for American shipping in general all along the East Coast. Um, so that's kind of problematic, of course. People are concerned, they're worried. They don't want uh, anything happening to their lifeways, right? Especially here in the Gulf where we rely on shipping. Um, the other thing that was kind of uh, curious to the locals was that Weimar was a tramp steamer and she traveled all over the world and as a result, her crew was very diverse, right? You had Scandinavians, Europeans, all sorts of sailors on this vessel um, traveling around. And so uh, they weren't, th these people weren't locals. They weren't uh, Americans. And so there was some suspicion about the crew because of their diverse nature. Um, so when uh, Baymar was heading out um, with her load of lumber, she was guided by the harbor pilot and there's, um, a suggestion that probably she was overloaded, right? She had too much lumber. And of course their job is to make money. So why wouldn't you take as much lumber as you could? Um, but again, the wind freshened as it does here in Florida. And eventually water started coming over the side uh, from Weimar. She started listing to port and she started going down by the stern. Um, the harbor pilot was able to get the ship outside of the main shipping channel in Port St. Joe. Um, but at some point, the crew completely abandoned her, as well as the harbor pilot, and all of them returned safely back to Port St. Joe, which is not too terribly far away. Um, so for a few weeks, the, the captain and the crew remained in Port St. Joe. Um, of course, everyone was suspicious of them because they were very diverse. Um, they're sailors, they like to drink, they like to frequent um, red light establishments. Um, and this, of course, drew um, kind of the criticism of the locals as well. And so the idea began to float around that this crew had intentionally sunk Baymar, or tried to sink Baymar in the shipping channel as a way to sabotage Port St. Joe's um, commerce. Um, there was an investigation. Um, the Coast Guard uh, actually sent two divers onto the wreck to determine the cause of her sinking. And after their investigation, it was um, determined that there was nothing, um, nothing bad going on here. The ship did indeed sink because potentially the lumber cargo had shifted and water had started flooding the ship. Um, but of course, there's a, still a lot of local legends surrounding Weimar. And if you ask some folks in Port St. Joe who've been there a while or they've had families there, um, they will still tell you about um, the sketchy activities of this crew and the, the, the German attempt to sabotage Port St. Joe as a city. Um, so really, really interesting stuff. Um, here is a photo of Weimar as she exists today. Um, she is in about 30 feet of water, so relatively shallow. Um, a good dive if you can make it out to her. Um, the wind picks up very quickly in Port St. Joe, which is probably one of the reasons why the ship sank where it did. Um, so it can be a challenge to dive the site, but if you do get a good dive day and get to go down on Weimar, it really is an excellent dive. Unlike the previous shipwrecks we saw, this isn't so much a plan drawing of the shipwreck, but this is a photo mosaic. So this is a series of photos taken on a really good day and kind of pieced together to show you what the ship looks like. And it looks pretty flat in this photo, but there's actually some good elevation on this shipwreck. Parts of the, the outer hull are actually standing up fairly tall. It's, it's an excellent dive and there was a ton of life on it when I dove it, um, which was about one month before Hurricane Michael. 
I have not been back to that shipwreck site since Hurricane Michael, and I'm pretty curious about how it looks um, today. I'm hoping to get over there again soon. Of course, we're not doing much traveling right now, so I'm not sure when I'll be able to get back. Um, here are a couple of photos. Again, this is kind of showing you the framing sections and outer hull plating on Weimar. Um, Weimar did become an underwater archaeological preserve, um, became the ninth one in 2004 after being nominated by the Port St. Joe community. Oops. And that's where she is today. Um, again, I don't know how she was affected by Hurricane Michael and be really curious to see how that site has changed over time. You know, as underwater archaeologists, when we, we record these shipwreck sites, we're capturing a moment in time. These places and these sites actually continue to change constantly. So sometimes it's hard to keep your finger on what's going on unless you're diving them very frequently. Um, and that is the end of my presentation. Um, Hope you'll excuse me for going a little bit long, uh, longer than I wanted to. I get excited talking about shipwrecks and there's so much to tell and they all have such amazing stories. So you can see why I limited it to three shipwrecks rather than all of the shipwrecks in Northwest Florida. <laughs> and well, you have had a few uh, questions pop up while yeah. we were talking and I think Karen H uh, had her hand up right from the beginning and I don't want to leave her off. Oh, She's gone now, I think. I don't see her hand anymore. Okay, we'll skip her then. Okay, um, Ellen Navarro, where was the shipwreck that you're able to snorkel? Um, the shipwreck that you're able to snorkel, the, I think you're alluding to the two that I, I showed pretty early in the mm -hmm. presentation. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. That was in a spot called Shields Cove. Um, in the Blackwater River, and it's over here in the Pensacola area between Escambia and Santa Rosa counties. Okay. And if 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 um, if you're interested in in diving those sites, I can um, provide more information about how to visit them. Okay. And then Katie wants to know: Is the tarpon uh, the ship display at the Florida Archives modeled after? Ooh, that's a good question and one that I do not know the answer to. I did not know though there was a ship display at the Florida Archives. Um, I can find out the answer to that question and then um, get back to you. Um, hmm, I'm very interested now. You've piqued my interest. Next time I'm over in Tallahassee, I'm going to go check that out. Thank you. Okay, anybody on here from the archives? Oh, Catherine's got her hand up. Let me allow you to talk, Catherine. Okay, Catherine, I think you've got to unmute yourself. Could you elaborate, okay, could you elaborate on the meaning of the name BB2 on the USS Massachusetts? Uh, yeah, um, the, the BB and then the number designation basically is just a way for the military to keep track of what vessel they're talking about. Um, so they're actually, there are multiple USS Massachusetts. Um, so to avoid any confusion, they've kind of come up with this system. There is also a USS Massachusetts, which is a BB-49 that was built in the 1930s. Um, so I don't, you know, it's a good question. I don't know what BB, I guess I never asked that question. Um, but yes, it's, it's a naming system. So BB, um, I've just wikipedia this, which is not the greatest source, but we'll use it for right now. Um, it is a, a, a designation, and it usually BB is reserved for battleships. Yes, I think mm -hmm. someone already answered that for me. So excellent. yes, yes. Military vessels are not my um, not have not typically been my focus of study. I'm more into um, fisheries and fishing vessels. Um, but good, good question, and I learned something as well. Okay, Rhonda asked, is the salt also a factor in preservation or is that only in food? <laughs> yeah, salt is definitely a factor in, pre in preservation. Um, salt water eats away at, at wood and organic materials. And so when archaeologists are working on underwater sites, um, we have to actually flush the salts out of any saltwater artifacts or saltwater ship components. Um, if the, if, 
these artifacts or components are in freshwater, we can then go ahead and just initiate the preservation process. Um, but if there's salt water, what we first have to do is a series of freshwater baths in order to flush all of the salt out. The problem with salt, especially for iron artifacts and for wood artifacts, is that they break down cell walls or they, ca they cause corrosion or oxidization. Um, so yes, there are a lot of extra steps for preservation when we're talking about saltwater environments. Eventually, the steps are very are all the same, whether it's uh, saltwater or freshwater. Um, but saltwater, yes, we've got to flush all of those out before we can start the preservation. Um, I know um, somebody asked about where you could get your poster. I did put on there that you're going to share your email address, yeah, or you can contact the Tallahassee chapter of FPAM. Is that correct? Yes, I'll go ahead and throw my email address in there right now. Um, go ahead and shoot me an email if you're interested in a poster. Um, I can either mail one from my office here in Pensacola or like I said, we do have staff in Tallahassee um, and I can get you connected with them to, to initiate a poster transfer. So yeah, happy to do that. Okay, and Natasha says, thank you. This was awesome. Are there diveable ones at 70 feet or less? And she's interested in the in dive sites as well. Yeah, so all of the shipwrecks on the in the Underwater Archaeological Preserves program are put in that program because they are um, divable shipwrecks for recreational divers. So they're all relatively shallow. Um, of the three that I talked about, um, Tarpon is the deepest at 95 feet, but USS Massachusetts and Weimar are very shallow dives or relatively shallow dives. Um, so those are good uh, open water certification dives. If you're not familiar, uh, there's also the Panhandle Shipwreck Trail, which is another product of Florida, um, the Bureau of Archaeological Resources. And this, the Shipwreck Trail um, was a product of, um, after the Deepwater Horizon, as part of grant money, um, to try and get people interested in doing some shipwreck diving and to kind of reinvigorate the economy um, in that sense. So Panhandle Shipwreck Trail, let me get the URL for you. Um, I was doing these, the same thing. Yeah, these are also <laughs> all diveable sites, all of them. Um, some are deeper than others. All are excellent dives in our area. And um, this website is a little more updated. A lot of the go. shipwrecks on here are, are historical wrecks. They're older. Some of them are archaeological, so they're natural shipwrecks. Um, some of them are intentionally sunk. Um, so they were sunk to be artificial reefs, um, but makes them, they're still interesting and they all have really good histories in and of themselves. So definitely check that Panhandle Shipwreck Trail out too. Okay. Oh, Dana, thank you for letting us know that about the Florida history exhibit is a Spanish shipwreck. Okay. Okay. But the uh, museum at Carabao features the exhibit on the tarpon, an exhibit on the tarpon. So that's yes. great. Okay. Yeah. And I'll, um, um there's a really good website, and since we're talking about Spanish shipwrecks here real quick, <laughs> Florida History in 3D, and this is another product of the Florida Division of Historical Resources, and this is mostly relates to the Spanish plate fleet wrecks in South Florida, so not the panhandle so much, um, but they have scanned, 3D scanned artifacts from the collection from these 1715 and 1733 shipwrecks. And you can actually interact with some of those scanned artifacts in kind of a virtual 3D environment. Um, and it provides you some history about those shipwreck sites as well. Um, so that's a really neat website. Okay. We've got one more uh, hand up um, from Yoda. I'm gonna allow you to talk and let's see. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Yoda, you need to unmute yourself. Are you there? No? <laughs> Hands up. Okay. We're going on to the next question then since I can't get, we can't hear you. I unmuted you, but you got to unmute yourself. Okay. Um, Oh, it was an accident. You put your hand up. Okay, thank you. I'll <laughs> I'll I'll disable you again then. Okay. Um, what is the story of the shipwreck on Dog Island that was unearthed by Hurricane Michael? 
Oh, okay. So that's a, a really good question. Um, yes, Hurricane Michael had a major impact on a lot of the coastal resources in the Panhandle. Um, and Dog Island is, um, I, I say that ships don't tend to wreck on top of each other early in the presentation, um, but Dog Island seems to be the exception here in Northwest Florida. Um, Dog Island is what we call a ship trap. Its, it's location and the frequency of storms in our area just seems to be a magnet for ships, um, especially in bad weather. And so after Hurricane Michael, there were a lot of news stories going around about the, the ships um, that had been exposed on Dog Island. Um, and they were very exposed after Hurricane Michael, which actually was good for archaeologists because it gave us a chance to document them in a way that we had not been able to do so before. Um, but the ships that were exposed were really late 19th century ships um, that had actually wrecked during a hurricane then, so 1899. Um, and there are several different types of ships. There are large schooners, um, some transport vessels. There are about 15 ships wrecked on Dog Island in 1899. Um, and they've mostly been there and they get covered and uncovered. I think to my knowledge, they had not identified which ship it was specifically that was uncovered by Hurricane Michael or ships that was uncovered by Hurricane Michael. Um, but they are ones that have been documented before at various times. But like I said, after the storm, we were able to get out there, um, do some 3D scanning on those sites, which is kind of a new exciting technology for underwater archaeologists, um, especially in making sites um, accessible to the public, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, but also to, to document those sites in a way we hadn't been able to do before. So yeah, a really good question. So what was uncovered? Uh, 1899 shipwrecks, not totally sure which one it was or what the name of the vessel was, but, but yes, they are known sites. It looks like Stephen and Natasha, y'all been diving a lot of these ships already for us, so that's awesome. Um, you guys need to do your own presentation and share what you found yeah. um, or been seeing um, for us. Um, and we have a question from Natasha. Do any of these vessels have spearfishing options? Spearfishing, yeah. Um, so in the state of Florida, you can spearfish on these sites as long as you're not within 100 yards of a beach or a bridge or a dock. Um, so you can spearfish on these sites. Um, as a diver, I will say that shipwreck sites tend also to attract uh, rod and reel fishermen. Um, so that's something you kind of have to dodge a little bit as a diver. Um, there's a lot of uh, animosity between fishermen and divers sometimes on sites because um, they're competing, not really competing, but you know, space is limited. Um, but yes, yeah, so they're often rod and reel fishermen, but you can do spear fishing on some of these sites. And I will say um, it's a little more toward my way here in Pensacola, but one of my favorite sites to spear fish is uh, called uh, the San Pablo, which is on that Panhandle shipwreck trail. Um, and I could do a whole presentation about that ship's history. Um, but yes, spearfishing is totally allowed as long as you, again, are not within a proximity to a beach, dock, or a pier. Great. Is everybody else quiet again? I told you they start talking about 6.30. They start popping in with all their questions. <laughs> everybody stays quiet till about 6.30. Did I miss anybody? And I'll say, you know, my email address is in the, mm -hmm. the chat box there. So if anyone does have any questions or they wake up at 2 a.m. and they're like, why didn't I ask this? Feel free to email me. Mm -hmm. I'm always happy to answer questions. especially Absolutely. About or you can email me and I will send it on to Nicole. Um, oh, two more. Oh, Natasha, I will share her email with you if you didn't get it. Um, or you can always look at FPAN's website and find her. There are ways to track her down. Oh, we got one more in here. Oh, Anne. Anne says, thank you for a presentation. Fascinating. Good. Well, I'm, I'm so glad everybody Good. enjoyed yeah. it. Um, it's a topic I'm pretty passionate about, so it's fun for me to be able to share that with other people. And I'm mm -hmm. glad there's so much interest on this topic. Yeah. Everybody seems to have loved it. You're a great presenter. <laughs> <laughs> Do it a lot. Do it a lot. <laughs> yes. Let me go. Okay, well, I want to say thank you for joining us this week, everybody, and Nicole especially. Um, it was a fabulous presentation. And like everyone's saying, we all enjoyed it so much. Um, next week, we will be um, back here Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, we'll be having a cocktail and crime, 
uh, with Dr. Lee Bouchong. I think a lot of you already know uh, Dr. Lee. He is a professor at FAMU as well as, well as a psychologist and profiler, um, a veteran of the uh, police force. Um, he's also underwater uh, policeman, um, diver for uh, crime scenes. He's done a little bit of everything, um, but we're going to be talking about um, the title is He's Crazy, She's Crazy. Um, we'll be briefly discussing some mental pathologies that impact people as it relates to relationships and crime. Ideally, we will cover the telltale signs of disorders, that, what those disorders may be recognized as from a behavioral perspective. And for individuals who fall into certain categories, what challenges those behaviors present to others, as well as to identify people who may cause harm within intimate relationships. So if you have issues with your mate or spouse and uh, want our partner and want to join us for that, um, I've seen him do this presentation in person and it's fascinating what you will learn about just other people in your lives even. It doesn't have to be um, an intimate relationship. It's, uh, it's a really great presentation. I learned so much from um, Dr. Lee Bishong um, when I saw this the first time and you can't believe what you learn just about people in general um, from his talks. So um, again, back here same place same time um again thank you nicole i really enjoyed it um and if you need anything please contact me and we will be here again um i'm always here so um and we will see you next week and please everyone be safe stay safe um take care of yourselves and be well thank you so much thank, thank you everybody all right thank you have a good week